Over the many years I've been leading yoga teacher training programs, I am always surprised at how much debate there is as to what the real goal of yoga is. I think most people would probably answer something along the lines of enlightenment, but actually, that's not the goal of yoga. So I thought I would give us a new goal to pursue in this podcast. Welcome to the Modern Mystics Podcast. I'm your host, Alana Kaivalya, the yoga doctor. I'm here to help you realize your potential as a spiritual leader and elevate your work in the realm of yoga, mysticism, and spirituality. This podcast covers all of our favorite topics, yoga, alchemy, astrology, divination, spirituality, psychology, ritual, and mystical practices, both ancient and modern. Get ready to up-level your status as a modern mystic. Many of us have probably, at some point, studied the Yoga Sutra. The Yoga Sutra is the most well-known text that talks about the philosophy of yoga. It was written 2,000 years ago or so by a teacher named Patanjali, and it's often referred to as Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. The Sutra is a very small book. There are only 185 or so short phrases written in Sanskrit. So typically, if you purchase a Yoga Sutra, you're purchasing a commentary. You'll see the phrase in Sanskrit with its translation, as well as a bit of explanation as to what each of those phrases means. Funny enough, this means that all of those explanations are really personal interpretations, and so sometimes people have differing ideas as to what they mean. Now, largely within yoga, it's been my experience that it is taught that the eight-limbed path, which we find in the Yoga Sutra, is a hierarchical path. Perhaps you've heard of it this way. So, for example, the eight limbs are Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi. Yama and Niyama, the first two are the ways in which we treat others, that's Yama, and then the ways in which we treat ourselves, that's the Niyama, and there are five of each of these. The next step is the one that we're most familiar with, which is Asana. These are the postures of the practice. And then we have Pranayama, which is breath work. Pratyahara, dharana, and dhyana are all more uh, deep forms of, of meditation. So pratyahara is the withdrawal of the senses. That's literally just the ability to sit there and not be distracted by other stuff. So not be distracted by the phone ringing or the text coming through, not be distracted by the smell of something baking in the kitchen, not be distracted by the thoughts or the itchiness that always seems to arise on your face every time you sit to meditate. I know, it happens to me too. So Pratyahara is a practice of becoming less and less distracted by the outside world. So technically, it's a type of meditation. Dharna and Dhyana, again, are more progressive forms of meditation where we're able to focus our thoughts either a little bit sporadically, which is Dharana, or continuously, which is Dhyana. And then finally, we have Samadhi. And Samadhi is also a form of meditation, but it's a special meditation because we're in a state of being. It's not like we're trying to sit there and meditate. We just are. So samadhi, the word translates quite literally as the same as the highest. Sama meaning same, and dhi being the shortened abbreviated form of words like our, uh, uh, shortened abbreviated etymological root of words like divine or deity. So same as the highest. When we feel and experience ourselves as completely connected to something greater than us, that is samadhi. Now, oftentimes, yogis are taught that this is the goal of yoga, that we're supposed to start at yamas and niyamas and eventually work our way to samadhi. And then, yay, we have achieved it. (laughs) We've reached it. And I guess a host of yoga angels will descend from the sky and give us some sort of gilded certificate. I don't know. That's not the way it works. And that's a bit of a misinterpretation of the sutra. So the sutra are not written in a hierarchical form. It's not like you have to do step one before you can do step two, 
and then you have to do step three and so forth. And in fact, if that were the case, all of us would be doing yoga wrong <laughs> because it's my guess that you probably started with asana, which in this dynamic would be step number three. So you've basically already failed the test. It doesn't work like that. These aren't sequential or these aren't hierarchically done. So it's not like we have to tick the box of step one before we move to step two. It's the way that it's organized is from the most external to the most internal practices we can do. Patanjali was very thoughtful about this. The most external practice, of course, is how we treat others, which is what we find in the yama, and then how we treat our actual physical person, which is the niyama. And then moving this physical person in order to create a little bit more contentment in the body, which is asana. And then the breath is the first bridge that we have from the physical body to the mental, to the mind. Uh, the breath is the only autonomic function that we can control, right? You can't control your heartbeat. You can't control the flow of your blood. But you can control your breath. And even if you don't control your breath, you still breathe anyway <laughs> because it's an autonomic function. So it's got this really cool purpose of bridging the outer and the inner. And then from uh, pranayama, the breath work, we move into more uh, subtle uh, types of meditation with pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, and then samadhi. So it's an external to an internal ranking. It's not a ranking of importance or a ranking of this should be done first. And samadhi isn't the goal. It's simply one of the practices that we do in order to achieve what could be described as the goal of yoga. Now, really, let me be clear. There is no goal to yoga because there is never going to be an end point to your practice. It's never going to stop. There's never going to be a day that you get to say something like, oh, yay, I did it. Yeah, yoga, check, done. Okay, what's next? It doesn't really work like that. As human beings, we're consistently evolving. We're very dynamic. Life comes at us in many different ways. We've got other stuff to deal with. We just, essentially through consistent yoga practice, we just get better at life. You know, yoga doesn't make your life better. Doing yoga doesn't, it's not going to, it's not going to be sparkles and rainbows and butterflies all the time just because you do yoga. Your problems are not going to suddenly go away just because you do yoga. Yoga doesn't make your life better. Yoga makes you better at your life so that your life as it is continues and you get to say a, a more and more enthusiastic yes to this life as you have it with the problems, with the challenges, with the difficulties, because those don't go away. I don't care how much yoga you do. So you just get more well-practiced by implementing these different things that Patanjali has recommended in his eight-limbed path. This is the Ashtanga yoga path, not the branded form of Ashtanga, which is you know moving and breathing to a certain series of postures that's different. This is Patanjali's Ashtanga yoga, the eight limbs or the eight steps to personal practice, essentially. And again, on subtle and more and more subtle layers from the outer to the inner. So that's how it's organized. And samadhi is merely a practice. It's just a thing that you would do in order to, again, re reach this quote unquote goal of yoga, which I've described there is no goal. But if there was, if there was a thing that we could say as a goal, what I would tell you is that it is the ability to do something consistently and that something is what we call viveka. Viveka is a Sanskrit word that means discernment. When you have enough of a practice under your belt from all of these eight limbs, you are able to very consistently employ viveka, which would be the greatest thing that you could do as a result of yoga. Viveka or discernment is the ability to make excellent choices. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in just a moment, but I want to talk about samadhi because samadhi is a state of enlightenment. Okay. And again, enlightenment here is not the goal. It's just a practice that you do. I mean, it's really great. You're going to feel great in enlightenment. Sure. But it's not the goal. It's not like once you get enlightened, life stops. You just get to sit there. <laughs> until the end of time and not participate or engage in life. You actually have to keep participating and engaging in life. So somehow you have to employ this state of enlightenment in a functional manner. Think about that. 
right? So we want our enlightenment to be functional. Let me, let me talk about what samadhi really is. So samadhi is the state of being. It's the same as the highest. When we know ourselves to be completely unified with something greater than us, that's a state of samadhi. Samadhi is a psycho-spiritual state of mind. It's a mind that exists, or excuse me, it's a state that exists within both psyche and spirit. So it's a very holistic state of being. Now, what's cool is that you've already experienced this. All of us have experienced states of samadhi or enlightenment. All of us. It's not unique because any human can do it and pretty much every human has. What's unique about it is the ability for it to be sustained. Most of us experience a state of enlightenment in a very fleeting sense. So, You've experienced when you're in what we call a flow state or a state where you feel like time is just, you know, non-existent. Whatever you're doing, you could do it for basically forever until somebody stopped you or you're just immersed in the beauty of something. We often experience it out in nature when something takes our breath away or at the moment that we fall in love or see a baby that's a part of our family for the first time. These are moments of touching that glorified and elevated human experience that we call enlightenment. But if this was a more natural state for you, a more sustained state for you, it wouldn't be such a shock. <laughs> it wouldn't you know, stop you in your tracks all the time. It's not like all of a sudden you're going to hit that state of samadhi and then just not be able to move for five minutes while you sit there sustaining it. You can actually do it as a constant everyday practice in your life. It can be your new normal. And ultimately, that's what you want. Because if you're in this ultimately elevated, deeply connected state, you're going to make great decisions for yourself. In that open-hearted, holistic, connected state, you're always going to choose what is most right for you. And that really is the goal of the practice here, the ability to say yes to our life and to choose what is always going to help us to lean toward the light. Because here's the reality. Every choice that any of us makes, I don't care what the choice is, small choice, big choice, what to eat for dinner today, how to, uh, you know, whether or not to paint our, our room, um, to drive to work or to walk. I mean, ev- literally every decision that we make at any given time on every given day has both positive and negative consequences every decision. If you extrapolate the effects of that decision out, you're going to find that every decision will have both positive and negative consequences. They just will. There's no way to avoid that. It's basically a law of the universe. We can't change it. The only thing that we can do as individuals is our best. We always have to choose what will help us lean more toward the light and away from the dark. Now, what's really interesting is that what we choose is an individual matter. What I choose that allows me to lean more closely to the light may absolutely be different from what you choose. There is no one right way to make a choice. So we need to be very careful about judging others for their choice or about trying to impose certain kinds of choices upon others because we feel it's more, quote, right. It doesn't work that way. There might be very good reasons for someone to choose differently. But as long as they're choosing because it helps them to lean towards the light, then they're doing light work. So for us as light workers, this is an incredibly important skill to possess, this skill of viveka or discernment. Now let me walk through the eight limbs and explain to you a little further how each of these helps us with creating better choices for ourselves. Because as human beings, all we do all day long really is make choices. Our life is a string of choices and it starts from the moment that we uh, regain consciousness in the morning when we wake up. We're going to choose to hit the snooze button, or are we going to choose to pop out of bed? Are we going to choose to listen to music or the news as we get ready? Are we going to choose to take a short shower or a luxurious long one? Literally, choices all day long. But if we could employ those choices as a practice and employ our skills of discernment, Viveka, then our whole life becomes a practice. Life is our practice. It's our offering, everything in it. 
And I'm telling you, an enlightened state of mind is going to go a long way to you making excellent choices for yourself. So if we start with the yamas and how we treat others, these are guidelines to how to treat others in such a way that makes everyone happy. I mean, that's a pretty good choice. So we can fall in line with those yamas. We're always going to be choosing things that help us to lean toward the light. Same with the niyamas, make our physical and our personal person happy. Again, if we're falling in line with those niyamas, we're going to be making excellent choices. Asana, the ability to keep this body healthy, is an excellent choice. Pranayama, the ability to bridge our consciousness. I can't tell you how important this is. Because truly, the psycho-spiritual state of yoga, if it is anything, it is the holistic state of the psyche, where your supra-consciousness, your consciousness, and your unconscious mind all have an opportunity to work with and communicate with one another. And if pranayama isn't the first step towards doing that, my goodness, I don't know what is. Again, great choice. Meditation helps to reduce the chatter of the ego, which often gets in the way of great choices. The ego will often have us choosing what leans toward the dark. And that's no bueno for us as spiritual practitioners. We want to lean towards our version of the light. And then, of course, there is samadhi, the final practice listed by Patanjali. But again, a practice that can be done when you first start yoga or if you've been doing this for 20 years to make that state of enlightenment, the state of yoga, your new normal. Because in that state, again, great choices. So really, yoga is very practical. It wants you to live your life. It's not here to make your life better. It's here to make you better at your life so that everything becomes in its own way a joy, in its own way a spiritual practice, in its own way a blessed offering from you to you. So, my friend, I hope that you've enjoyed this podcast, and I hope that you consider it to be one of your great choices. And if you have enjoyed this podcast, as well as the others in this series, then please go ahead and leave a review on whatever podcast application you use to download this or listen. I would really appreciate it. And it goes a long way in helping others to find the podcast too. As always, if you'd like to continue this conversation, I would love to have you in my highereducation.yoga membership. I'm going to give you a $1 two-week trial when you go to highereducation.yoga slash trial to sign up. Thanks again, and until the next time, namaste.